Good morning. So good to see all of you here today and to uh, be in this place of worship. Thank you all for coming. We have a lot of guests and visitors, and as always, we're delighted that you're here uh, to be with us. Um, we have um, a couple of things to, to mention this morning. One is the painting party that we've had on and off all week is uh, almost completed. We had a crew of about 12 people here on Monday to paint the Fellowship Hall. You know, you do that about every 25 years, so I figure... <laughs> You know, it's no, no rush, but it turned out really great. And if you'd like to go over and take a look, uh, we still have more touch-up and other things to do, but it's certainly gone a long way uh, for brightening up the space and I'm uh, going to get some new lights and all. It's going to be great. Uh, so thank you for all the people that showed up. I wanted to have uh, pictures up on the screen, but I uh, didn't get to that this week, so we'll do it next week so you can see some of the folks doing their, their good work. We have good painters in this church. Yeah, very flexible ones too, because they had to get up and down and climb the ladders and all that. No, it was it was great. Um, another uh, announcement is actually a flyer that's in your bulletin for a Super Bowl Sunday on the seventh of February, from at the conclusion of the worship service, essentially ten forty-five to eleven fifteen. Uh, drive by, pick up soup um, on that day, and it will cost you canned goods. You got to bring canned goods. All of the um, and, and all the food will be donated to our local food bank. And so you can look at the, uh, the flyer that's in your bulletin and read all about that. But it's a great, a great opportunity for us to uh, care for our community. Um, and other than that, I think that's all of the announcements that I have. Oh, yes, that's right. Thank you. Well, I was going to do that. Yeah. We have one of our members who um, uh, reached a tremendous milestone, uh, Roderick McPhail, one of our elders, uh, became an American citizen uh, on December the 8th, 9th, December the 9th. Uh, after 37 years of trying. <laughs> yep, well, he, you know, he's a Scotsman, which means he is very, very dedicated and committed and will make something happen when he says it will. But uh, it's been a, uh, a journey for him, and we want to celebrate with him. Uh, right now, he, he and um, uh, Henrietta are at home um, because of other you know, issues of, of COVID, but uh, they do watch the service every day. So, uh, Roderick, congratulations. We're proud of you. Isn't that great? <laughs> Well, with that good news and so much other good news, let us turn our thoughts and hearts over to God and let us begin our time of worship.
please stand? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Give praise and thanksgiving to God, for he made all things. He alone stretched out the heavens. Rejoice and be glad, for God remembers his purpose and does not forget his people. He blesses the dry ground with streams of living water and his servants with all that they need. Let us worship God. Let us worship God. Please be seated. privilege now to confess what we believe using the great words of the Apostles Creed. Let us stand and do so. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated.
When the darkness appears and light draws near and the day is past and gone, at the river I stand, guide my feet, hold my hand, take my hand, precious Lord, lead me That's beautiful. Our scripture passage today, our first one, comes from the book of John, where Jesus calls some disciples, Philip and Nathaniel. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathaniel and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You shall see greater things than that. He then added, I tell you the truth. You shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. And then we go to the book of James, the fourth chapter. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but you don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive. Because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. This is the word of the Lord. Turn to God for a moment of silent prayer. Here's a secret for preachers, anybody that, out there that ever aspires to do this. You will find uh, things to speak about, little notes that God will give you is the way I look at it, in the strangest places. You always have to be aware, keep your eyes open, have a pen ready to make a note or something like that, because you will, it'll come at you from the left field somehow. And this is where this illustration came from. I was actually in a car, drive, I, I, I committed myself that uh, year to re-read old classics. I read a lot. Uh, so far this year, I've read 54 novels. Yeah, I've been busy. Well, not this year. Well, not, not 2021. That would be something. <laughs> Oops. Anyway, right, you get it. But I wanted to re read the old books that I loved. And one of them was Huck Finn. I hadn't read it since I was uh, a teenager. But I didn't have time to hold the book because I was doing a cross-country trip to, uh, to get to Natchez, Mississippi, of all places. And it was just long enough that I could listen to the book. So I went to the library and got Huck Finn and uh, the um, audio books and was listening to it on the way there and back. 
great adventure. I loved it. it. It was great. But while I'm driving, all of a sudden, I heard something uh, that was in, in the, the book that I'd never heard before. And I had to actually back it up and listen to it a couple times to remember it, where it was. And that's so why I looked it up because it was about prayer. Now, if you're going to do a sermon about prayer, Huckleberry Finn is probably not where you're going to go. You know, it's not, it's not really the thing. But Huckleberry Finn had this quote. Let me read it to you. This, of course, according to Mark Twain. Miss Watson, she took me in the closet and prayed, but nothing come of it. She told me to pray every day, and whatever I asked for, I would get it. But it weren't so. I tried it. Once I got a fishing line, but no hooks. It weren't no good to me without hooks. I tried for the hooks three or four times, but somehow I couldn't make it work. By and by, one day, I asked Miss Watson to try for me, but she said I was a fool. She never told me why, and I couldn't make out no way. I sat down one day to back in the woods and had a long think about it. I says to myself, if a body can get anything they pray for, why don't Deacon Wynn get back the money he lost on pork? Why can't the widow get back her silver snuff box that was stole? Why can't Miss Watson fat up? No, I says to myself, there ain't nothing to it. Now, I wonder how many people have come to the same conclusion about prayer that Huckleberry Finn did. There ain't nothing to it. But the problem that Huck Finn had, and I suspect that problem many people have today, is the same problem that has been going on for many, many, many years. What they have rejected, prayer, is not prayer at all. And so what I want to do today is to define prayer, which you know preachers do all the time, by what it's not. Let's look at what it is not. First of all, I want you to define prayer by what it is not through magic. Prayer is not magic. A man once constructed a box that he called the prayer box, and then he talked to people, have them pray into it, and they would do it hour after hour. They would pray to God, and then he would close it, somehow to en encompass and, and to encapsulate all of that energy of their prayers. And then when a crisis would happen, he would just open the box. I, I, I don't understand that. I don't understand. Prayer is not magic. I went to a, a, a magician's conference one time up in South Carolina at one of the high schools. It was really delightful, all amateur magicians, and I could never figure out how they did it while I sat there in the audience. I mean, uh, have you ever been to a, a magic show yourselves? Have you ever seen, you know, David Copperfield doing something really cool? I mean, they're making elephants disappear or a Learjet vanish on live TV. Don't know how he did it. Don't really know how all that works. But they do this sort of thing. And the truth is, it's just magic. It's just the Christian's way of saying abracadabra when we say that magic and prayer are the same. Amazing feats can be accomplished when you pray, but in our best moments, all of us know that prayer is not magic. For one thing, magic shows are useless. They're just useless spectacles. There's no practical purpose for somebody to make the Statue of Liberty disappear and then reappear. There is great mystery when they cut a woman in two and put her back together, but everyone knows it's just a show. She really didn't get cut in half. If there's one thing that we should know, it is that prayer, real prayer, is not magic. So if there's one thing we should know, that's it. But number two, prayer is not merely a childish ritual. So many of us learn to pray when we are children. Children develop these rituals that have little meaning except for the security that it gives to them. Did you ever see a child cling to their blankets as well past its useful life? How did you get your child to get rid of their pacifier? These are tough things. Some adults don't want to give up the security of their childish ways either. At the state fair last year, I saw a teenage girl, she was about 16 or 17 years old, and she was walking around looking at things, and she had her thumb in her mouth. And I thought to myself, good, good gravy, that, that, you were much too old, too mature to be doing that. It's something you should give again up years ago, but, but she had not. In the same way, some people bring their prayer life unchanged from childhood into their adult life. They cling to the same childish prayers that served them well when they were five or six years old. One woman who was 69 years old admitted to me that what she would still, still kneel down at her bedside each night and use the phrases of her childhood in her prayers. Bless thy little lamb tonight and ended with make me a good girl. 
Her prayer life had never developed beyond the childish level. That seems to be a rather extreme case of arrested development. But many people still pray as they did when they were children. And while it is certainly a wonderful thing to hear a child say, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep, but some adults have never discovered a deeper meaning, a deeper level to their prayer than this childish level. Authentic prayer is not magic. It is not a childish ritual. And third, prayer is not a transaction. For many, many people, most people probably, prayer is essentially a deal they make with God. And it's always a selfish one at that. Prayer is like a vending machine. If you put your prayer in the right slot, you push the right button, then the vending machine, God, will spit out exactly what you want. But God is not a vending machine. Grace is not something that is mechanical. And so prayer is not a transaction. And it is also not a divine insurance. Some very devout people read a chapter like, uh, Psalm 91 and conclude that bad things simply do not happen to good people. There's a beautiful song that we sing here. In fact, it's, uh, I've sung it at a number of funerals over the years. And the title is On Eagle's Wings, a very scriptural song. The words come from the Psalms. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, or the arrow that flies by day, or the pestilence that stalks in darkness, or the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. No evil shall befall you, no scourge come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. It's a beautiful song of assurance and comfort. But the rest of scripture makes it very clear that God is not an insurance broker. We know from the rest of the Bible and from our own experiences that the good do suffer. That the righteous do perish. That those we love are sometimes lost to us even if we pray fervently to God to spare them. Certainly the psalmist is right in assuring that living with God in our lives is clearly the best way to find joy and happiness in life, but it doesn't automatically turn out that way. Jesus did not preach the health and wealth gospel. He never told the disciples that if they followed him, their fishing business would prosper, that their worldly success would increase. They would never get sick and life would be pleasant and easy for them. Instead, he said, quote, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. He promised his, his followers persecution and difficulty would come after them. And as they endured to the end, they would be saved. Authentic prayer is not magic. It's not a childish ritual. Prayer is not a transaction or insurance. And last, prayer is not a speech. Now, this is a hard one for us, isn't it? I mean, one of the biggest problems we have with prayer is thinking that God is somehow interested in our vocabulary. How many times have you heard prayers that were really miniature speeches offered as proof that the speaker was well-educated? This is one of the biggest problems for preachers. You know, somebody will say to me, you know, um, we're going to have a dinner in a little while. Do you think that you could say a blessing? Which, which is always an honor to do so. But it's not like I have to sit down and think of something because I'm always in prayer all the time. It, when, I, I was thinking about it before the service and how, how to say this, but when I go home, I do not begin my conversation with Deborah by saying, oh, dear wife of mine that I love so dearly, I am so glad that you have made spaghetti for dinner. No, no, no. How do you, how do, you do that when you walk in to speak to your spouse? You say, hey, how you doing? Good. Hey, you know, wait, listen, are we doing the spaghetti tonight? Isn't that how all of your conversations go with people? Why is your conversation with God any different? I mean, why do you be, just because you're not uh, speaking to God out loud all of the time, why are you thinking that God needs to be addressed the way that, well, you know, they train us in seminary that for collective prayers, you, there's a formula that you follow and you just don't mess with that formula, I get it. But if you think that that's how I pray, <laughs> you got another thing coming. Prayer is not a speech. 
In Matthew 6, 5 to 6, Jesus says, And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. I once heard an invocation at a Holy Week service in which the speaker quoted every verse in the evangelism tract titled The Roman Road to Salvation. I proceeded to give an invitation at the conclusion of the prayer, all in the guise of a prayer to God. That was not a prayer. It was a sermon, an evangelistic sermon directed at people who are lost. Now, there is a place for that. There's nothing wrong with that, but we should not mix that up with an authentic prayer life. We shouldn't mix it up at the end of a sermon either. I, I remember advice that my uh, mentor, Frank Harrington, from the Peachtree Church in Atlanta, told me it, when he said, don't preach your sermon over again when you conclude your, your in prayer. If they didn't get it the first time, they won't get it the second time. And he was absolutely right. Absolutely right. And you can do this. Because you see, authentic prayer is not just so much the words that we say as the attitude of our hearts. We can do this. More than half of real prayer should be listening. <laughs> really? Do we do that? Do, do, you, do you do that on a regular basis? Yeah. Don't feel bad. People all over the congregation are shaking their heads. Yeah. If prayer is a conversation with God, then why do we do all the talking? Let that roll over you for a second. After all, the Bible says plainly that God knows what we're going to say even before we say it. Jesus said, when you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows that what you need before you ask in Matthew 6. The preacher in Ecclesiastes agreed with that. He said, never be rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be quick to utter a word before God, for God is in heaven and you on the earth. Therefore, let your words be few. Most people approach prayer as a method of getting what we want. They assume that prayer is an unconditional blank check written by God, and all we have to do is go out and cash it. But that is not true. Dr. Robin Myers, who's the pastor of the Mayflower Congregational Church in Oklahoma, wrote this. He said, prayer moves us in the direction of God. And the closer we get to God, the more we are changed, unaware. Not because we have done something magic, not because we have recited a formula or rubbed the toe of a statue or intoned the name of a saint, but because prayer, if it is honest and real, makes us more receptive. Makes us receptive. It breaks down our defenses against the holy and leaves us vulnerable to God. It swings open the door of our hearts and invites someone else to be in control. This is no small thing. This is to the soul what food is to the body. Prayer is not just some meaningless religious observance that we perform to prove our sincerity. Prayer is more to do with understanding how to be in God's presence than it does with rattling off some grocery list of things that you want God to do for you. Prayer is about learning to be God's friend. Jesus doesn't want us to remain merely his disciples. His higher calling for us is that we become friends. In John 15, he says, I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you, I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from the Father. In prayer, we intimately connect with the heart of God and we are no longer just disciples, but we have become friends. We become connected to the inner life of God's heart. And there's no greater way of experiencing intimacy with him than that. Almost every hymn that he described, as, it can be described as a, a prayer set to music. This, the one that you sang today, which by the way, I, I did not realize you were going to sing that today, but precious Lord, take my hand, is a beautiful, beautiful what? Prayer. It is a prayer. It's not just empty words or some statement of theology. It is an intimate, precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on, help me stand. I am weak, I'm worn. Lead me on to the light. You know the, you know the words. 
It's a beautiful, beautiful prayer. It, back in 1903, Cleveland McAfee was serving as a church of First Presbyterian Church in Chicago. Now, we don't have a lot of Presbyterian hymns. You know, our, our preachers are better with theology books than they are with music, but, but they, we do have a few, and this is one of them, and I know you're going to know this. He learned some terrible news that his two beloved nieces had died of diphtheria. And he turned to God and the scriptures, and from his grieving heart, he wrote these words of music. And they came to him, and on the day of the funeral, a double funeral, he stood outside the quarantine house of his brother Howard. And he choking back tears, he sang this hymn. The following week, the chancel choir sang it in the church. There is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God, a place where sin cannot molest near to the heart of God. O oh, Jesus, blessed Redeemer, sent from the heart of God, hold us who wait before you near to the heart of God. Near to the heart of God. Is there a better way to define prayer? One of the giants of faith, C.S. Lewis, wrote about prayer. The moment you wake up each morning, all of your wishes and hopes for the day rush at you like wild animals. And the first job each morning consists of shoving it all back. And listening to that other voice, talk, taking that other point of view, letting that other, larger, stronger, quiet life come flowing in. That's your prayer. That's your prayer every morning. Prayer is your most effective tool. And I am convinced that God's hand moves when people and pastors pray together. Through prayer, God truly makes that which is impossible, possible. Let us pray. Our Father, we are, we are aware of your presence when we come into this place. We, we are aware that we need you uh, in, in our lives. Not just now, but 30 minutes from now when we're out of this place and, and going about our lives. And tomorrow morning when we get up and, and each and every day, Lord, we too often go about this in such a strange way. All we do is talk, but today, today we listen. Amen. I have some... Uh, Speaking of prayer, I have some prayer cards up here. Um, are there any others besides these that I, these were passed up? I think we're getting a little bit uh, short of prayer cards in the pews. We'll make sure by next Sunday there, there's a bunch of them in there. So, so why don't you if you look down to see if they were there? Well, if you can look down, grab one and fill it out. No, that's good. Okay. Here's one from, uh, from Mary for Antonio. Uh, my daughter is having more tests for cancer in their, her colon on Wednesday. So pray for healing. Mary, we will do so. Antonia is her name. Um, this is the um, Carol Kirftis. This is um, for the, is it Stoner family? Is that Stoner, family Stoner. family. Yeah. Cousin. yeah, cousin passed away. And uh, continue with the Albright family, her brother-in-law. Both of them uh, died from COVID, right? Well, no, my cousin actually got a nosebleed that they could not stop. Yeah. And they kept having transfusions, but he passed away on, on Thursday. Okay. And this is, is it the Grohl family? Yeah, continued prayer for the Grohl family. Grohl. Just cancer and um, Okay. All right, the Grohl family uh, dealing with issues of cancer. Um, and this is uh, prayers for Sam Mills from Texas was in a serious car accident eight weeks ago, coming out of the hospital today. Praise the Lord. That's from Tim. Thank you. I think you let us know about that accident. So that's a good update. Thank you so much. All right. Well, um, how many of you got your uh, vaccine shot? 
Yeah, all right. We'll keep working at that. And then the goal is to, to go. I, I managed to get mine done on Thursday, but I had to drive to Orlando uh, to do so, which I don't know how you feel about it, but I'd, I, I'd driven to France if I could to get it. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but there are, um, they're, they're, they're ramping it up, and I will encourage you that it really was no problem at all. I mean, I, the guy said, you might have a sore arm. No, I didn't get anything. It didn't even hurt when they did it. So, uh, and boy, I actually left my appointment 20 minutes before I was supposed to be there. <laughs> the, I mean, they were quick, they make it happen. So please uh, just keep trying and uh, I think that'll, that'll be great. All right, let's turn to God for some words of prayer. Well, God, we come together this morning aware and open to a new light that you give us in Jesus Christ. We come together to refocus our priorities and to become more alert to your actions in our lives. We come together to find new joy in all the ways that you bless us. And we come together seeking your direction in ways that we might break down the barriers we have created among ourselves and against you, so that others may be drawn to your life-saving love. We come to hear again the summons of Jesus to follow me, and we ask that we might be led in ways where we might proclaim the gospel in our daily lives. We ask you that all of ourselves, our devotion, our time, our talents, and our commitment be dedicated to faithful service in your name. For you bring light out into darkness. You increase our joy. You ease our burdens. And so in faith, we can set those burdens before you, knowing that you can lighten the yoke upon our shoulders. We place before you our fragmented lives. Teach us that we may not depend on our doing and having for a sense of worth. We place before you our friends, those who are hurt, addicted, sorrowing, struggling children, frustrated parents, and fragile marriages. Teach us the sacrament of caring as we reach out to others in tangible, concrete acts of love. We place before you our church, Teach us the way of trust and compassion and empower us to share the story of our faith where we live and work. And we place before you our broken world, a world yearning for justice and freedom. Teach us the paths of peace and give us a brighter vision and hope for the future. Especially this week as we somewhat ominously see um, the actions being taken by extremists in our own country we don't know what we individually can do except to come to you in prayer. And we pray for peace. We pray for understanding. We pray for a sense of country that places all of that above our own individual needs and desires. It's hard to find the words for us in a country that seems so divided today. But, oh God, we know that you can you can join things together that we cannot even fathom. And so we ask this week be a week blessed by you of peace and unity. We ask this. As loving God, we open to you today our hearts. We open to you your ceaseless and outpouring of love as we awaken to your presence. When we are anxious or troubled, you comfort us. When we are faced with difficult choices that confuse us, you are there to guide us. You have surrounded us with your love before we even turn to you. So may we follow you as faithful disciples our whole life long. Through prayer, through meditation and times of quiet, we turn to you. And now, Hear us as we join our voices together in the great prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
And now one of our very favorite hymns, actually when the congregation sings this, I always get notes about how much we enjoy this hymn. So. Please stand. Well, go from this place. No God goes with you. Thank you for uh, worshiping with us and for all of our visitors today.
we're so glad to see you and hope you'll come back. Um, next Sunday, the, uh, the message has to, the title of it is Canines in the Kingdom of God. And it's, uh, yeah, it's the story of the uh, um, Canaanite woman uh, confronting Jesus. And she says to him, but even the dogs get to eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. I hope you'll look forward to that. I'm looking forward to sharing that with you. And so uh, please go from this place and know that God goes with you and share God's love that you have received here wherever you may go this week. Bob, you've got your Bible study on Wednesday? Yes, and uh, we're going to be starting a new study next week. And I'll have books there if everybody wants to come. It'll be a good time to join us if they would like to. Great time to join from the very beginning. But I know you can join at any time with your class, but this is a good time to do that. So be there this Wednesday at the Fellowship Hall at 10 o'clock, right? All right, that'll be great. All right, well, God love all of you. And now receive the benediction of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the power of the Holy Spirit, we go forth into the world to fulfill our calling as the people of God. Go in peace. And may God, the God who believes in you and in Christ laid down his life for you, bless you with a gentle heart, discerning mind, and a spirit eager to share his love, this both now and forevermore. Amen.
<laughs> well, I wanted to, but Michael was like, Dad, I really, um, you know, his dog, Duval, doesn't go around other dogs. Oh, really? Well, because yeah. they've been sequestered for so long. And so he's like, I don't know what he would do with another dog in the house. And I'm like, well, she gets along great with 